Hello, everyone. It is so exciting to be starting this up again. Uh, we've been away for quite a few months, but now we're back and couldn't be more excited to be starting up this new series all about the life of Jesus. Now, Jesus has to be the most riveting person to ever have walked this earth. There's just nobody that comes even close. And I think the fact that we're here 2,000 years later, ready to learn about his life and his words is a testament to that. So for the next 25 le weeks, as was mentioned, we're going to walk alongside of him. We're going to watch as he performs some amazing and incredible miracles. We're going to listen to his words and his parables and try to uncover what he really meant by them. And in doing so, of course, we hope to reflect upon the incredible act of salvation that Jesus has made possible for you and I. So today we're going to start really simple, uh, hopefully lay the groundwork uh, for what we're going to be looking at in the rest of this series. Now, I grew up a Christian, and my family made a habit of what we called the Bible readings every night. Didn't always happen, but we did it whenever we could. And that usually involved reading three sections of the Bible. So we do two readings from the Old Testament because it was longer, and one reading from the New Testament. And so with that method, usually we were able to get through most of the Bible in one year. Now, sometimes my family would go on vacation, and that usually involves staying in a hotel room. And so quite often we'd roll into this hotel room pretty late at night. And even though most of us were really tired and either just wanted to go to bed or watch the cooking shows on TV, my parents would sit us down and we'd do our Bible readings. Now, it didn't take us long before we realized that in every hotel, you can open up the top drawer of the bedside table, and without fail, there's a Bible. But there was a problem. When we went to read from the Old Testament, it wasn't there, because the Bibles in the hotels only ever had 29 books. All 27 books of the New Testament were there, along with two books of the Old Testament, Psalms and Proverbs, but they didn't have most of the Old Testament. Now, why is that? Why would somebody print only half of the Bible? Well, obviously there's logistics and printing costs when it comes to printing millions of Bibles to put for free in every hotel room. But I think it's also because most people only want to read the New Testament. And part of that is because they want to read about Jesus because his teaching is amazing and powerful. And sometimes the Old Testament can seem really big and long kind of scary. It's filled with all these super strange stories. But what we want to do in this series is to help you understand that the Old Testament, though it may be big and kind of strange sometimes, it's actually full of the foundation and context for Jesus' life. So we'll give you an example just to show what we mean by that. So we're at the end of Jesus' life. You see him hanging from the cross. He's been there for hours in agonizing pain. And he's finally close to dying. And you can imagine it probably would have been fairly quiet as everyone watches on. Some are very glad to see him there. They hated him and wanted him dead. And many are sick with sadness. And in the gloom, you hear him say, I thirst. And they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it to his mouth. Now, you might ask why he said that. And if you just think about it for a second, the answer is fairly obvious. He's been beaten. He's lost fluids. He's been hanging in the heat of the sun for hours. But the Bible actually tells us why exactly Jesus said these words. And if you haven't picked up on it already, it's not just because he was thirsty. John 19 verse 28 says that after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. So that's why he said it, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And that's actually a phrase that John uses nine times uh, throughout his gospel, referring to Jesus doing things and saying things so that the scripture might be fulfilled. Well, what does that mean to fulfill the scripture? Well, to fulfill something, obviously, it means to bring it into reality or to accomplish something that you've set out to do. So by saying, I thirst, Jesus was accomplishing something that he'd set out to do. What was that? Well, about a thousand years earlier, before the cross, King David wrote a psalm. 
And as he was writing that psalm, if you read through the whole thing, you can tell that very obviously David is in distress. He says in Psalm 69 that the floods were coming over him, that he's sinking deep in the mire. He says that the people who hated him were more than the hairs of his head, and that he'd become a stranger to his very own brethren. So it's very clear that David is sick with worry. And in that psalm, this is what he says. He says, I am weary of my crying. My throat is dry. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Doesn't that sound familiar? I mean, it's exactly the same thing that John chapter 19 says. And actually, if you were to go through and read all of the stories of Jesus in the Gospels, and then go back and read Psalm 69 in its entirety, you'd be shocked by the amount of similarities that are there. And so what we put to you is that what Jesus is doing is when he says, I thirst, and all these other things, he's seeing himself in the Old Testament scriptures. Now, if you're a bit skeptical, you're not quite sure that that is what he's doing. We'll prove that to you in a minute. Now, the next thing he says after I thirst, you know what that is? He says, it is finished. Now, why do you think he's saying that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, obviously, he could be referring to his life. His life is over. It was finished. But more importantly, in the context that we've just looked at, means that Jesus knew that everything he'd been on earth to accomplish was finished. You know that feeling when you have a long list of tasks to do in a day and how good it feels when you finally checked everything off? You can sit back, you usually say something along the lines of, I'm done, or it's finished. Well, that's exactly what Christ had done. He'd lived his entire life making sure that he'd checked off each item on his list. And so when he said, I thirst, he could check off that item from his understanding of the Old Testament. And on the screen, we just have a couple of examples of things that happened in Jesus' life, uh, specifically in this case around the crucifixion, that John says he did so that the scripture might be fulfilled. And you can find those, those to-do lists, that to-do list in the Old Testament. So, like we said, if you're still not convinced, you have to read this story in Luke chapter 24. This has to be one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and I know it is of a few of my friends, because it's just filled with dramatic irony. As we read it, we can understand everything that's going on, and we just watch as the two characters in the story are absolutely clueless to everything going on around them. I think the best way to experience this story is just to read it. So just know that this is all taking place three days since the death of Jesus. He's already been risen from the dead, but the disciples, his followers, have no idea. They think he's he's gone for good. So Luke chapter 24, verse 13 says, And behold, two of them, being disciples of Jesus, went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs, which just, by the way, is about 10 kilometers, probably about a two-hour walk. And they talked together of all these things that had happened, all the events that took place in his, in his unjust death. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. So they have no idea that it's Jesus. And he says to them, what manner of communications are these? What are you talking about? And, and why are you so sad about it? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, and I love this answer because he has no idea who he's talking to, says, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? And it's not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And Jesus said to him, what are you talking about? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it would have been him that should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since it was done. And this is what Jesus says to them. 
And Jesus said to them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not, or isn't it obvious that Christ should have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now just think for a moment what it would have actually been like to be there. I mean, essentially, this was the greatest Bible class that has ever been given. And it would have just been earth shattering for these disciples to see the Old Testament. That's what the prophets and Moses is referring to. The Old Testament come alive in a way that they'd never experienced before. It says that Jesus took them through all the passages in the Old Testament that spoke about him. He would have gone through passages about his birth, passages about his mission and everything he had to accomplish, uh, verses that showed that he was supposed to suffer and then be raised to glory. And perhaps he even took them to that psalm that spoke about him being thirsty on the cross that, that David wrote. So imagine for a minute what it would be like if you could read all the stories of Jesus' life with the same understanding that Jesus gave to those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Imagine that whenever you came to a story or teaching of his that seemed strange or confusing, you could point to an explanation in the Old Testament. Imagine you could find the very prophecy that explained why the wise men came looking for Jesus, or that you could turn to any verse in the Old Testament to explain why Jesus spoke in confusing parables. Imagine that you could know not just what was happening during the crucifixion, but what Jesus was thinking as he went through it all. Because reading about Jesus without reading the Old Testament, it's kind of like watching the third movie in a series. Have you ever done that where you jump in with a friend or something who's already watched the first couple movies and you figure, you know what, I'll be fine jumping in part way through. But it's confusing, isn't it? You might be thrilled with the story, uh, still find the experience of watching it enjoyable and rewarding, but without all the background of the previous movies, you're just not going to be able to understand the full uh, experience. You can, you can miss the clever nuances that characters make and the references that they make. You'll probably make some wrong assumptions. You just aren't really going to experience the movie in the way that the director intended. Well, reading the story of Jesus without the Old Testament is just like that. You miss the nuance and the meaning behind his teaching, and you can get confused with why he does things a certain way. So that's our goal for this series of classes. We want to show you how you can find Jesus on every single, in every single book of the Old Testament scriptures. So in this series, we're going to see amazing prophecies about his birth, his life, his resurrection. We're going to see events in the Bible that actually were a foreshadowing of events that would take place in his life. And trust me, when you start to see these stories in the Old Testament and how they relate to Christ, it's going to blow your mind. And it seriously changes the way that you'll read the Bible for the rest of your life. And we're going to see how there are Psalms that give us insight into the thoughts and feelings of Jesus as he went about his life. So as we said at the beginning, the life of Jesus has to be the most riveting story there's ever been. And together, what we're going to do is explore that story in a way that gives it entirely new life. But in the end, this isn't just about seeing the amazing story of Jesus unfold. Because one of Jesus' most beloved disciples penned these words toward the end of his gospel account. In John 20, verse 31, he says, These things and that's referring to the specific signs and the miracles that John chose to record, are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So the study of the life of Jesus isn't just fascinating and inspiring. It can bring the reward of life to those who put in the effort to truly believe him. So that's all I have for introduction tonight. Um, as I mentioned, it is really exciting to be starting this up again. We hope you'll continue to join us for the rest of the series. Uh, and it's not just me who's presenting these. We have a whole group of much more experienced Bible students than myself. They're going to help lead you through this story. And I really think it's going to be amazing and eye-opening and helpful as we try to learn more about the most amazing man to ever walk the earth.